Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadreando Podcast. I'm your host, Marcy. And we have a dope guest here today. Her name is Kiara. I will let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hi, 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 everyone. My name is Kiara Luna. I am a mental health therapist. I am a public speaker. I am a mom. I'm a wife. I'm all of it. I'm also a new published author. My very, very first book, uh, Becoming a New You. And yeah, that's who I am. Awesome. Okay. And uh, Kiara and I connected because um, I made connections with Jose from Trilo. And um, he was like telling me about her and her new book and everything. And I was like, you know, she sounds like somebody that really is aligned with my brand and like what I'm trying to accomplish right now with um, the podcast. So I was like, let me just bring her on. And then um, I want to introduce today's topic, which is therapy in communities of color. So the reason why this topic came up is because I felt like it was something that should be addressed. Um, your book is doing a, a large part of like, you know, talking about that part. And um, I've done a few episodes on dating, but I've not had yet the, pre the pleasure of bringing somebody who does relationship therapy as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about everything, right? And why it's important to have therapy um, to deal with our traumas in the past. Okay. Yeah. So let's get into the topic. Let's Tell do me it. about the work you do regarding therapy in communities of color. Yeah. So a lot of the work that I do uh, in my private practice, so I'm also the owner of uh, New You Psychotherapy. Uh, it's a private practice. I just started uh, January. And a lot of the work that I do is working on childhood trauma, working and addressing uh, anxiety, depression, a lot of work, uh, a lot of cognitive behavioral work, right? So really focusing on how also our thoughts uh, impact our behaviors and our emotions. So really also uh, learning and teaching really how to rewire your brain and how to be more empowered and knowing that you have control over your thoughts and and how much they dictate the way that, you know, your emotions are and your thoughts are. I also work on self-esteem. Um, I work with a lot of women on addressing self-esteem. I work with a lot of couples as well. So addressing, uh, you know, issues in the, in, in the relationship, uh, patterns of behaviors that show up uh, in the relationship often, uh, miscommunication. Uh, and, you know, I always bring back the childhood traumas into the relationship because a lot of those things typically repeat in our relationships and a lot of us are not aware that we, we are not aware to make uh that link that oh wow wow like a lot of these characteristics actually were the ones that were showing up for me during childhood so when we do make those connections a lot of uh of my couples really become closer together because they now feel more empathy towards the pain that they are uh making their partners go through that's so amazing. Um, it's important. Like, you know, it's funny. Like, people are like, oh, no, you're, like, just bringing things up from your past. And it has nothing to do with your present. But a lot of those traumas that we carry with us from our past continue to show up in relationships. And they create patterns, like you said, right? Um, and unless you're cognizant of that, like, those triggers and things that, um, you know, come up from your youth you're gonna be bound to keep repeating and and going out and dating the same type of people absolutely and you know in our culture you know how it is our parents mm -hmm. don't want to talk about anything that have to do no, with anything course. negative uh so it's really it's really complicated for a lot of us to even be able to uh receive some validation because we are afraid that we're going to be met with anger, or frustration, or invalidation, right? So I know if I bring something up, right, to my mom about childhood, it's like, what are you talking about? Like, ¿qué estás hablando, muchacha? Ya se pasó año. Yeah. Like, what's the point of you bringing this up? And I'm like, well, I want some validation. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, and like, it's really hard. It's really hard. And, and then bringing those things up, it's, it's like, oh, why are you stirring the pot? Like, why are we talking about this now? Like, it doesn't make any sense. And um, I just want to tell the listeners that it is, your feelings are valid. And 
you know, your experience, just because somebody didn't see it that way while you were growing up, does not invalidate your experience. Because, like, exactly. even siblings in the same household could have experienced two completely different sides of the spectrum, you know, of their relationship with their parents, as opposed to, you know, uh, you know, the other sibling, right? The other sibling might have yeah. had an easier time or it would have it might have been a different, completely different experience than what you, you know, what you were going through. Because remember, like, and I know you can probably um, uh, chime in on this, but, you know, everybody's experience is internal, right? Like the things can be happening. We can all be experiencing the same thing, but it all affects how we're doing um, mental health wise and where we're at, you know, my me experiencing the things that I experienced in my um, my past as a child, experiencing it now with the um with the things that I've been through would be a completely different person experiencing them, even if it is the same situation, same environment, and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. And reality is that you know, as children, we all perceive information differently. Even as a, as adults, you know, we still like you and I can go read the same book and if somebody asks you hey how do you how do you think that book was you mm -hmm. would probably say oh it was great and people somebody would ask me i'm like oh no it was i didn't like it you know so totally different experiences despite uh, uh living the same experience mm -hmm. so that's the same thing that happens to us during childhood you know so i wanted to ask you another question so can you tell me your thoughts about the importance of doing the healing work before jumping into a relationship Yes. So I have, I have like two answers for this question, yeah, right? Go. Because so part of me, um, I do believe that it's important to get to know yourself and get to know what your triggers are as much as you can, uh, mm -hmm. to really f further understand, you know, what are some of the things that might need some work, right? Because we have, we have all adapted a lot of, uh, maladaptive coping skills mm -hmm. from our childhood, right? We had to in order to survive, right? So I always give this little thing and I even include it in my book, which is we all are born with needs, right? Emotional needs, mental needs, physical needs. And unfortunately, our parents are not always able to meet all of those needs for us, mm -hmm. right? So what do we do? We have to figure out how to live in that environment, right? Without getting that need met. So what I do is I mold myself into something else, so I'm able to survive in that environment, right? So the example I always give is, uh, you know, men men are not supposed to cry, right? So whenever, you know, boys were crying, they were always sent to their room or always made made to feel uh, like they were being girls. Like, oh, you're not a girl, stop crying, right? Yeah. So now the, the little boy has to, has to learn how to literally stop expressing feelings and emotions because now every time I do this, my mom is going to be upset or I'm going to be um, screamed at, right? Mm -hmm. So now, right, so now I have to not cry anymore or at least not cry in front of my mom. So now I'm here. I learned that, well, suppressing my feelings was actually a good thing, right? So now I get, I, I'm older, I'm an older man. And what, I, what happens now, I have difficulties expressing my feelings because that's not something that was practiced uh, during childhood, right? So here I am now, um, I molded myself and... I, I have this thing, but a lot of us, we are not aware that of these maladaptive coping skills, right? We, because that's what we had to do to survive. So we continue to behave the same way because we think that's the best way to behave today, right? So at times it's really important that we do the work prior to jumping into a relationship because when we jump into a relationship, that conflict is going to come up. I mean, we know when we date emotionless men, right? That it's really hard. We feel like they're cold. They're not getting us. You know, we're like, you, you don't love me. You don't, you don't, you don't show any, any type of emotion, uh, whenever there's conflict or anything like that. Right. Uh, so it's important, but at the same time, I also have a different response because I also feel that sometimes we do the most growth in relationships, right. And, and, and also in our intimate relationships, because, there's nothing else that's going to challenge me more than my partner, right? That's where I'm really going to notice like, oh my goodness, I have all these triggers, right? But now I also have to be 
conscious about conscious about those things, right? About these triggers that are coming up, and it's not just me blaming my partner for them, but it's also me doing the homework to really figure out for myself how comes how come these are triggers for me, what's going on? And the issue is that a lot of us don't do that. You know, we just focus on 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 the fighting, on the blaming, and not really doing the homework for ourselves to figure out okay, what's going on? How come this is something for me? What's going on for me? Yeah, being conscious of those triggers is important because, like, you know, it might not be exactly what your partner is doing or saying. It Like, whatever feeling comes up is not necessarily directed at whatever it is that they did. It's more like you're upset about how that's making you feel, but, like, you know, really digging into why it's making you feel that way, you know? And, like, yeah. being more conscious of it because things are going to happen. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, we, we also do the most healing in our relationships because, you know, when, for example, in couples therapy, when we come and we kind of unpack all of these childhood traumas and we realize, you know, that, oh my goodness, you are literally speaking to me the same way that dad used to speak to me. This is why this is so triggering. Or you, you lecture me just like dad used to lecture me. So of course this is a trigger for me. And I stonewall, I shut down, right? And I can't speak anymore because I'm so overwhelmed with my feelings. Then we, we have something to go off of. Then we can really make um do the work the healing work right because now mm -hmm. the partner is going to know what to do in order to help her hit his or her partner heal from that experience right so now i'm going to actually not lecture you anymore right so mm -hmm. now i'm going to really work with you on on how to have uh conflict discussions in a healthier manner and also validate your experience, you know? Yeah. And to communicate in a way that you don't, you're going to understand that you're going to receive the message that I'm trying to communicate to you. Right. One thing that I found when I was um, going to therapy and, um, you know, doing the healing work before I started dating again was that um, it was very hard for me to accept help from people. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Um, as being an older sibling and, you know, the, a girl in, in our culture, it is expected that we are, you know, number two in line, right? So for me, when I have a partner that wants to help me, I'm like, nah, 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 I got it. Or, or let's say they don't know how to help me. I didn't know how to ask for help, you know? And there would be like a, like kind of, um, like a guilt when I did need help, which is big. Like, you know, like even saying it now, I'm like, wow. <laughs> but it's yes. crazy because like, you know, I, I, I let I let the people that I'm dating know, like, you know, I'm not used to asking for help. And if you see that I'm overwhelmed, like, you know, I'm okay with you stepping in. Yeah. And, and, you know, growing up, we were taught that asking for help was for the week. You're not supposed to yeah. ask for help. You're supposed to figure it out, you know? Like if you need help, it's because you can't do it by yourself. And if you can't do it by yourself, oh my God, what does that mean about you? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So so we we are we are already so used to like putting all this pressure on us, you know, being superwoman, you know, so independent, we don't need nobody, you know, type of thing. And in reality, we are just making ourselves suffer more because we're putting so much pressure on ourselves, you know? Yeah. And then we have our partners feeling like they're they, you know, like we don't need them. Yeah. So now it's also how are they receiving that message? Because I know that I, I had the same experience. I also would, you know, I was, I got it all figured out. I don't need nobody. I, you know, I don't, I'm independent, you know, I don't need no help, you know? And I remember like my husband was like, okay, hold on. I'm here too. Like I can help you, you know, like, mm -hmm. what do you need me to do? You know? And, you know, I realized like, oh my goodness, like he's right, you know? And this is the same things that, that, that I discuss with my, my couples and individuals too, is that it's okay to let other people help you, you know? Mm -hmm. But then it's also figuring out for them their own experience as to how come it's so scary to ask for help. Right? Because a lot of a lot of people grew up in environments where they would ask for help, but they never got the help they wanted. So now what they learned was, well, every time that I ask for help. I'm not, I'm still not getting helped. So what's the point of asking, you know? So now it's, you know, everybody has different experiences. So really unpacking for every individual, what was your experience and how come that has led you to behave the way that you behave today? 
And then when they realize that, oh, wait a minute, I'm actually putting so all this pressure on me for no reason, they start to practice. Like, you know what? I, I love giving homework. I'm that therapist. I'm giving you homework every week, you know, because I need you. I always say to them, you come to see me here for 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and 15 for couples. This is not enough. This is just a portion, literally, of your week. You know, you have a whole life to live outside of the session. And just because you come here and you speak to me, if you don't practice the tools that we are uh, that we are um, practicing here and that we are also and that you're learning, then you're paying me for no reason. You know, so I'm very transparent with my clients too. Uh, I let I them know. That. I love that. So, uh, one going into kind of like that was a good segue. So going into um, you know doing the work and 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 healing together. Why is it important to set and enforce boundaries? Mm, boundaries. Boundaries are so, ex- so, so, so important. Uh, you froze for me. I can still hear you. Oh, you can still hear me. Uh, so boundaries are so important. Boundaries are, I always see boundaries as a foundation. I, 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 a lot of it as a foundation of our personality, right? Because it's based on our values. It's based on the things that we believe in. It's based on our morals. Our, you know, it's, it's based on the rules and expectations that we want to set in every relationship, right? And every relationship is so different. So one of the reasons why setting boundaries is so important is because, one, it lets the person know what you're okay with and what you're not okay with, you know? And it also informs that person of, just what you what what you expect, you know, and what your limitations are. And sometimes we're so scared of letting people know those things because we feel like they're going to walk away from our life or they're going to think that we're being too much. And the honest truth is that if we don't communicate those things to them, then we're always going to be in relationships where we feel that we're either being taken advantage of or maybe that, you know, again, that our needs are not being met the way that we want them to. Uh, so it's just so many different experiences that people feel when they are not communicating their boundaries. And typically it's just, it, it, again, it leads to you not feeling satisfied. So one thing that I feel people have issues with is um, communicating, like reinstate, not, not reinstating, but like restating their boundaries when, when they feel like their boundary has been violated. Like what would you advise someone? Um, let's say that, Let's say the boundary is like if I'm with my family, I would not like to be, you know, getting phone calls or whatever the case may be. And the person that they're with violates that boundary. Like how what would be like a healthy way to communicate that that feeling? Because I feel like that's the biggest thing for some people is communicating Mm -hmm. how they're feeling without attacking or like making that other person feel like they're attacking them. Yeah, sure. So. I would say I, I I would say something like you know Marcy uh, I, I I recall having a conversation with you in regards to our boundaries or in regards to this specific boundary, um, for example using using your phone um, and and our and our family time together and it really hurts my feelings when you are on your phone and we we have this com- and and when we are having family time, uh, that was the example Marcy right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good. Okay. So, so really expressing the feeling, right? Really expressing how that action makes you feel, and also the fact that you know we had this conversation prior, and it's and it's a little bit frustrating to me because it seems that you know this keeps on repeating, right? So, really being honest about the feeling that you're feeling because of the action, mm-hmm. right? Now, the scary part of this of communicating boundaries sometimes is because you're afraid of how the other person's going to react, right? You at times feel that the person might meet you with anger, or frustration, mm-hmm. or misunderstanding. So a lot of people don't like sharing their boundaries with other people again and again and again because they just feel like they're constantly going to be invalidated and not understood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, so we already talked about a little bit about childhood trauma and how it shows up in relationships in adulthood. So... um. I don't know if you want to talk about a little bit, like expound on that a little bit more or, you know. Mar- Marcy, you broke, you're breaking up for me so I can uh, really make sense, um, understand what you're saying. 
Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, this is more clear. Okay. So what I'm saying is that um, we already talked about a little bit about childhood traumas and how they show up in relationships. Um, can you give like a li like some examples of like behaviors, maladaptive behaviors that people develop to deal with um, those childhood traumas? Yeah. So let's see. Let's let's think of a few. So here we 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 spoke about men, right? So let's talk about uh, abandonment, fear of abandonment, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say that during childhood. Uh, my dad left at an early age or mom left at an early age and, you know, I felt abandoned. I, I can also feel abandoned because a older sibling left the home um, without really communication. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons, right? But let's, let's stick to that one. So let's say I have a fear of abandonment. Now I grew up being kind of feeling like people would always leave uh, and they would never stay. So what I would typically do now in relationships is it's many different things. It can show up very differently for everybody. Right. But let's say one example can be when we get into conflict and you're not responding or you want to leave the conversation, I get very anxious and I begin to call you constantly or not let you leave the, the, the apartment. Or let's say I, I text and text and text because I want to respond. And what this does is, it, and I'm doing this because I'm so scared of losing you. Right. But the way that it's showing up is as if I'm, be, I'm being, I'm kind of like suffocating my partner. Right. So, mm. so the very thing, that I'm afraid of happening, which is you walking away is what I'm causing by the behavior that I am exhibiting. Wow. Makes sense. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's so, so when we kind of, when we speak about that and we kind of, um, break it down in that, in that sense, really, really people are like, Oh my goodness. Like now it, it kind of makes sense now as to why, you know, um, I may do these things, you know? Um, so does that have to do with attachment styles? Cause I read a little bit about attachment styles, but I didn't do like a lot of research on it. So is that like a, um, what is it? A anxious attachment style or, or yeah. does that have to do with, um, with abandonment issues most of the time or, or does it have to do with different things? Different things, different things develop, you know, different type of, uh, attachment styles that definitely, uh, there's also the, the, let's say like people pleasing, right? So mm -hmm. people always say, and, and I speak about people pleasing also in my book and it's about, okay, but how does that develop? Right? Like what, what happens? And again, many different things can happen to develop people pleasing and people, right? But there is different circumstances. Let's say that my mom or my, my parents, caretakers, uh, emotions are all over the place all the time. So I don't know which mom I'm going to get. So now in order for me, what, what I found that works for me is that if I, I'm always kind of doing everything my mom likes that makes her happy, then she's, that she's okay. And I'm not going to get in trouble or I'm not going to be picked on for little things. Right. So I'm always pleasing my mom. And then what happens is what that taught me was, is that, well, I have to always please people, be in tune with other people's needs all the time in order to, you know, uh, be safe and be okay. You know, so then that also disconnects the child from their own needs and desires and wants, because now they're so hypervigilant about the needs of those caretakers. So he, he could be safe or she could be safe. Jesus, you're like blowing my <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa um, no seriously because it's like and then those people the people pleasers tend to get like really exhausted right from like um constantly being yes. hyper vigilant of the other person's needs and yes. you know neglecting their own you know they end up being tired in relationships because of it yes and resentful and so yeah. resentful because there is this other you know self-sacrifice maladaptive schema that a lot of women have a lot of us have this self-sacrifice right like the doing for everybody we are we are good at being you mm -hmm. know because we were taught to be good moms to be good wives to be good daughters to be good to everybody except ourselves right so yeah. here we are doing everything and being great to everybody else but we're not being great to ourselves mm -hmm. you know and 
<laughs> that self-sacrifice shows up so much in relationships too, because then we are so in tune with what our partners need and we are not in tune with, and we're not getting anything, but then we're, we also live up to that self-sacrifice sometimes mm -hmm. because we overdo things. You know, people are not asking us to, uh, to do anything for them, but we are voluntarily doing it for them. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit of us is like a, a, a little part of us is really resentful because we're mm -hmm. not getting that same, that same thing in return. Attention. We're not getting those same. Yeah. Yeah. We're not getting those, you know, those, um, the same affection or the same, the same, uh, energy that we're putting in. We feel like we're not getting. So because of that, we, we, we get resentful. Wow. That's crazy. I mean, it's not crazy. It's great. Like, <laughs> it's good that we're talking about it. No, yeah. cause it's, 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 it's really funny how, relationships from your childhood keep showing up in your regular yes. relationships, you know? Mm -hmm. And then um, on another episode that I had, I was talking about, you know, not only do we have a father wound as women, but we also have a mother wound, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's things that the relationship with our mother affects how we go on. I'm sorry, there's a truck passing by. Of it's course, okay. It's <laughs> um. <laughs> The relationship with our mother um, shows up in so many different ways, but especially how we relate to authority, mm. right? I've noticed that I hate being micromanaged, and it yeah. was because of the way that I was raised. You know, yeah. I wasn't let, like, I wasn't allowed to just kind of be. It was kind of like every minute of every day, somebody was on top of me telling me what to do. Right. So when I'm in a work environment that's like that, I have a hard time adapting to that kind of work environment, you know, but I already yeah. know that now <laughs> and I know okay. where it's coming from. So um, when I see that I am in a work environment that's like that, I usually, you know, call it not call it quits, but like find another place to be that is more yeah. my style of management. Yeah, it, it's tough right now. It's tough to it's tough to be banker manager. I mean, I don't think anybody. I mean, some people need it. Fine, some people do say that they need it. I just feel that micromanaging is not the best style because you're not letting someone grow, right? Like if mm -hmm. I'm telling you every type set of the every step of the way how you have to do something and what to do and how, you know, I'm not letting you grow because I'm not letting you actually use your brain and think mm -hmm. about how you think you can solve the issue, you know. So a lot of us who were, who had parents that were strict and always told us what to do and didn't give us space to think, absolutely don't do well with micromanagers. No, like <laughs> I used to work corporate and at one point I was like, I can't do this anymore. I fucking hate it here. Yeah. No, it was really bad. Um, okay. So in that same vein of like childhood and all that, um, if you could go back and tell your tell to your 10 year old self anything what would you tell mm -hmm. her wow my 10 year old self let me think you know i remember that around 9 10 years old i i made a promise to myself and it was to never cry again I remember that I said to myself, I'm never going to cry again and I'm going to be strong and I'm going to like, you know, uh, what did I say to myself? And I said that I was going to, um, you know, just make sure that I, that I, that I wasn't going to cry anymore. Like that was my thing because I felt like I was crying so much. Like I was, I always felt like I wasn't being heard as a child. And every time that I tried like speaking, speaking mm -hmm. up how I felt, I was mm -hmm. always met with anger and frustration and like, I was always shut down, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember that. I remember myself like going to my room and crying and being like, I'm never going to cry again and I'm never going to do this again and I'm never going to say anything else about this, right? And and I would tell myself now like that it was going to, care is going to be okay and don't stop speaking your truth. Like don't start, don't stop speaking about your feelings. Like I would tell her not to stop and I would tell her to, continue to speak her truth um even though she was not being heard even though i know now that that would have been really difficult but that's what i would have told her i would have told <laughs> her keep on keep on being in tune with your feelings yeah um 
I would probably tell myself, my 10-year-old self, to just continue to be my authentic self. I was very much like a creative child. And uh, one of my things was like, I used to love to create, like do different like drawing and painting and all that stuff. And there was like a point that there came that I was like seriously considering it as a career. And there came a point that somebody told me like, you're not going to make any money like that. Like, stop. Mm -hmm. You need to think about something more lucrative that's going to make you money and you're going to be able to, you know, bring the family up and all these other things, you know. I would probably tell myself not to stop drawing or creating. Okay. I see. So what I was okay. saying to myself was to continue to create. Mm. Mm. So you feel like that was... um kind of uh and like how do you feel like that part of yourself was that di like died down no it was like um basically i was told that i was not gonna make any money that i should consider doing other things um you know to be more 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 quote-unquote realistic um mm. and uh i feel like a lot like that was like a large part of myself and then that was like something that I shouldn't have walked away from like it was to a point that I was like writing and drawing and and doing all these great things and and I thought they were great but you know yeah. the people around me like the adults around me didn't support that so I didn't feel supported in that sense at least artistically yeah you know it's so sad too how at times uh in childhood like they kill our curiosity mm -hmm. right because you know how as children we ask so many questions mm -hmm. right? <laughs> hell what's this what's that and we are typically met with okay you're asking so many questions we stop you know oh my gosh like and then what that teaches us is that asking questions is a bad thing mm -hmm. so now we grow up and we are in meetings at work and we're shy to ask a question yeah not only that, because maybe my question like, yeah. yeah like i was like into like i really wanted to know like what it was like for my mother growing up or my dad growing up or mm. grandma when she was growing up, you know? So I would always ask these like weird questions like, so tell me about your childhood, you know? And I'm actually like really like genuinely interested. And it, it was kind of like, Muchacha, tu si jode, que se que, you know, <laughs> like, sometimes, like if they were yes. in a good mood, they would answer. But like for the most part, it was kind of like, Oh, que lo que tu quieres saber? whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's funny. Uh, all right. No, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. I do the same. I, I honestly, like, I, I take a notebook and I'm like, okay, mommy, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. And then I just start, like, asking her questions. And then when I'm, like, to question five, she's like, but you can look at me. Have a good okay, you're at the end. And I'm like, mommy, I just want to get to know, like, what they, like, what you went through so I can understand you more. Yeah, no, I know. I, and I feel like that's important, right? Like, if you know a little bit more about somebody's past, it, it gives you more. It helps you give them more grace exactly. and you're more forgiving. Um, one of it, the, it, go ahead. No, I'm so sorry. I, I was just going to say that it, it provides us with the, with the opportunity to be empathetic because the thing is that we cannot empathize with what we don't understand, mm -hmm. you know? So we, we can have a lot of opinions about people, but not, not until I understand your, your, what you've been through, your I'm truth. able to empathize with you, right? Your truth. And people don't understand that. That's why in our culture, it's, you know, there's a lot of criticism. There's a lot of judgments. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's, and I don't like it. I feel like one, that's not productive. I mean, what am I sitting here to criticizing anybody for? Um, sit down and criticize your own self. Yep. Right. Because the criticisms that you're saying are just a reflection of your own stuff, you know? So when you start speaking like that to people, they're like, what? No, I'm okay. Like, what are you talking about? I'm perfect. You know? What are you talking about? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So I just wanted to share that, that, yeah, that the more we, we know about people, about their story, the better, the, the better it is because we can empathize with them. In one of the episodes with um, Dr. Um, Griselda uh, Rodriguez, she's one of the ladies from Brujas of Brooklyn. She says that, if they mothered us like that, imagine how they were mothered. Mm, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it, exactly. It, it, like, it helps you give them grace and, like, you know, forgive them. Because at the end of the day, 
I know for a fact that if they would have known better, they would have done better, but they didn't know any better. Absolutely. They yeah. did the best they could, just like we are right now. Trust me and believe me. Our kids tomorrow are going to grow up with something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> something, you know? <laughs> and it goes back to the perception, right? To We don't know how they're perceiving things. Yes. You know? And as a mom myself, you know, I try to have a lot of conversations with my 11-year-old about life, you mm-hmm. know, and about the things that I do and even my actions and my flaws, you know? And I ask him too, like, what would you change about me if you could, you know? So I ask him questions just to, to, to let him know that I care about his opinion, even about me, because I also want him to know that you need to receive feedback from people in order to grow and be better, you know, from people you trust and love. That's amazing. I love that. That's so yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, another random question is if you could give one piece of advice to newly single people, who are Mm -hmm. coming out of a long-term relationship, what would that be? Mm, That's a good question. I would say take your time. Take your time to to be with yourself. Uh, Develop a healthy relationship with yourself first. Um, You know, get in tune with your own needs, thoughts, emotions, you know. Reflect on what worked for you and what didn't work in that relationship, you know. Reflect on your own maladaptive uh, ways of relating to people in relationships. Uh, do a lot of reading. Listen to a lot of podcasts. <laughs> you know, love yourself. Uh, pay attention to to how you speak to yourself too, right? Like, how, how do I treat myself? Mm-hmm. You know? Because I think that a lot of us expect a lot of things from other people but that we do not give ourselves. You know? So we expect people to... We expect people to, I don't know, uh, give us love and affection and, 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 you know, speak to us nice. And, you know, and then when you ask them, how do you speak to yourself when you are upset? They, they stop and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm pretty mean to myself. And, yeah, I don't show myself love. And, yeah, I don't actually think, like, I don't, I'm not gentle with myself. And when they realize that, you know, I'm like, okay, so so let's do some work there because it's unfair for us to expect other people to give the things that we're not giving to ourselves. I see you that know? all the time. It's important because the thing is like, you know, people come into relationships with these grandiose ideas of, well, I want to be doted on and I want to be this and that, which is fine, you know. Mm-hmm. But do you do that for yourself? Do you dote on yourself? Right. Do you treat yourself nicely? Do you speak words of affirmation to yourself? Do you uplift yourself, you know? And yes. a, a lot of people don't. And or like even I've seen women that are in the mirror and they're like berating themselves because they don't look how they think they're supposed to look. But then they have a mm-hmm. partner you know, that doesn't do like, maybe they don't speak badly to them, but doesn't say anything about their appearance. And, and, you know, you wonder why. And, and, and it's, you know, the internal, that internal voice is, is like everything, honestly. Yeah, it is. And realizing too, that a lot of us adopted that same self-talk from our parents, right. From our caretakers, how they used to speak to us, right. How, even if we were bullied in school or anything like that, right? We adapt those ways of speaking and we internalize them. And literally this is like, there's research out there that shows that when we hit our teenage years, we say, oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take all of these external voices and I'm going to now internalize them. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to call myself those things. This way, when you tell me those things, when you, when you, you know, um, call me names or you speak to me in a way that makes me feel not good enough that's not going to impact me as hard because i already know those things about myself Mm, you know so now so now that happens that when i and 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 also another thing that i always say to my clients to pay attention to and we unpack is characteristics of your caretakers because a lot of those characteristics that we really really dislike we have ourselves Right. So it's important to also pay attention to those things. So uh, it's like a mirror, right? Like you, you, the things that get on your nerves about other people, (laughs) it's literally the things that you don't like about yourself. So if, if, if you meet somebody and they just like irk your nerves to like, you're just like, oh, this person, God, I can't stand them. 
you have to look at yourself and see like if something of them, whatever it is that's annoying you is something that annoys you about yourself. And you have to yeah. sit with it and kind of like really think about it, you know, because a lot of the time we're just, when you're not conscious of things, you're just going through the motions and you're just like a little robot every day, day in and day out, day out, you know, receiving things and not really internalizing and like really looking at um, things with a, with a clear eye, you know, once you get to that conscious level of like thinking, mm -hmm. you can look at things and see them for what they are, you know? Exactly. And it's, um, it's, you know, I, I talk a lot about, uh, about the subconscious and the role that it plays in our life. Right. And how dangerous it can be if, if we're not able, if we're not aware of what could be there, right. If we're not aware of what our underlying negative beliefs could be or limiting beliefs could be right. Because if we don't recognize those things, we will, we would continue to behave the same way, you know, over and over again, we will continue to attract the same things in life over and over again, because there is a set of behaviors. There's a certain way that we're behaving that continue to attract those same people, you know? And if we're not able to link back to those negative beliefs that we may have about ourselves, mm -hmm. whether that is I'm unlovable or I'm a failure or I'm not good enough or, you know, if we're not able to identify those things for ourselves, we will continue to, again, behave the same ways and attract the same people and attract the same situations. Yeah. And yeah, it would just be a cycle until we're able to stop, think, right? And mm -hmm. rewire this mind and brain because the mind is so powerful. People don't realize that. And literally, like, our words are the programming to our mind, you know? Yeah. Like, our mind follows what we say. If I say that I cannot do this, trust me, you won't be able to do it. Mm -hmm. You're telling yourself you can't do it, I you know? I but that all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you think about it, and I, I recall realizing this, too, like, so early on, because I would always say in high school, I hate science. I'm so bad at science, mm -hmm. but I'm great at math. I'm great at math. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I was like, wait a minute, what if happens if I was to change the way I'm speaking? If I were to say that I'm good at, at science, you know, and I started my, my grades started going up, you know, so it is really a, a mind thing. It's a, it's, and it's the way that we speak. If I'm saying or oh, every day that I am not beautiful, that I'm ugly, I don't like how I look. I don't like, you would never like how you look, mm -hmm. you know? So you have to, and, and people have always pushed me back with, well, well, I don't believe it, Kiara. I don't believe it. I'm like, okay, I don't need you to believe it now. <laughs> you know, you didn't grow up. You didn't, you don't, you weren't born believing that you were ugly. Mm -hmm. You weren't born believing that you, you, you had these imperfections. Experiences happened in your life that made you feel that way and made you think that now. So you adapted that thinking. The same way you adapted that thinking, you can adapt a new thinking. Yes. Right? So... The mind. The mind is powerful. I we love, can do whatever we put our minds to. I love we can. That, the study of the brain and frequencies and like, you know, how we can make things happen, you know, just by, you know, changing our mindset and changing the way that we perceive things. It's so interesting to me. It's like one of my favorite things to study. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> so what is something you could share that no one really knows about you? Oh, Look at this I question. I feel like we're playing like 21 questions. Like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I can share that um, people don't really know about me. I would say, of course, people that are close to me know this information, but I don't, I don't think that people and the world know this information like out there. So it's not out there, but it would be that my six year old son was diagnosed with autism when he was a year and nine months. Wow. Nine months. Yeah. So I have a little one on the spectrum. So how has that been for you? How has that been for me? You know, at first it was really hard mm -hmm. because I didn't know what would happen. I didn't know what to expect. And, you know, I've been in the field for so long. So which really helped me catch on those like fl those spread flags that, or those signs really, mm -hmm. right? That that tell you like mm, something's not mm, hold on mm -hmm. and I was at that time I was also working with children mm -hmm. so I was already around it so I knew so I remember that I started noticing you know lack of eye contact and he started regressing mm -hmm. you know at first he was responding to his name then he was not responding to his name and I remember me telling my husband like I I think something's going on I think that that he you know, might be autistic, but then, you know, like when you're saying it, because one thing is to work 
in the field and another mm-hmm. thing is to live through it yeah. you know it's so different um so i something in my heart was something my brain my logical brain was saying like yes like absolutely my emotional brain did not want to accept that mm-hmm. you know it was like no maybe not nah, that's just me looking too much into it right but then when i started seeing i remember that you know like again like uh, things were happening that just like Again, signs after signs after signs. So I remember speaking to his PCP and getting him evaluated. He was like, the evaluation started at a year, when he was a year and six months. Mm-hmm. And ya para a year, when he hit a year and nine months, I remember that the, he was evaluated completely by everyone, the psychologist and everybody. And I remember receiving the call. Did I receive the call? She came, no, she came to the home. And at the end of the evaluation, she told me like, yeah mom like he he's on the on the spectrum and she couldn't really tell me like where because what did she say like i don't recall what she of said delay, she couldn't tell you yes yeah she couldn't tell me yeah because maybe it was too early they needed to do more you know like mm-hmm. go and evaluate the responses on everything they had all the assessments but she kind of said like yeah like it's very probable that he is mm. and i remember when she left i remember right oh my god i broke down i was like oh my god like what's gonna happen ah. and then i remember my husband getting home and me just like crying i remember that i cried so much and then i just had to you know pick myself up and be like you know what Kara? it's okay you know we're gonna get through this mm-hmm. and Thank goodness it's early so we can find the the right supports that he needs. And, you know, and we're going to get through this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, since then I just started, you know, I, I had, I remember that early on I had those little concerns like, oh my God, like what's going to happen when he grows up? Like, is he going to have friends? You know, is he going to like to socialize? Mm-hmm. Like what, what his life is going to look like, yeah. you know? And, and just, you know, thinking about school and how, you know, there's a lot of kids that, can be bullies in Mm -hmm. school and like so so all those worries you know come um come up uh still to today it comes up a a little bit i just really really i'm very i'm very involved parent when it comes to school Mm -hmm. so i'm i make sure that i'm I'm the teacher's best friend (laughs) yeah so i can cut you know so i can communicate with them often and just know you know how he's doing but you know it, it hit me hard at first and then as time was passing you know i had to make a lot of changes changes on his diet it was just a lot of research too to just understand more about it in him mm-hmm. um and then you know and then I, you, yeah so so it hit me hard at first but then i i i had to like get up and be like okay we cannot stay in this negative thinking you know so it goes back to the mind right we have to really expect the the, the best and prepare for the worst you know mm-hmm. but at the end of the day we have to keep on moving we have to you know uh get him the help he needs and y rogarle a dios que todo salga bien siempre you know of course um yeah that i posted something today and it's going back to what you were saying it's like the earlier you get help the better this is what i want to urge the comadre is like if you have a suspicion oh my god yeah anything just advocate for your child and 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 get them evaluated the worst that they can say is like no you're crazy not you're crazy obviously but no you're just being too you're being a new mom Mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong your child is fine whatever mm-hmm. but you know if you have a suspicion please act on that like go ahead and advocate for your child and then the other thing i wanted to ask um go ahead kiara no i just even wanted to say your um to the comadres also right because a lot of us as parents we we have this stigma about mental health mm-hmm. and it, it's big and Honestly, we do our children a disservice when we don't get them evaluated, you know, uh, because I work with a lot of adults who have been just recently diagnosed with either ADHD and even autism, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it's such a painful road for them mm-hmm. because it's just so difficult, you know, it's so difficult to imagine living with autism, but not knowing that you have that. Mm-hmm. You, that I mean, you know, it's so difficult for them as 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 adults, you know. And you know, the the earlier, like you met, were mentioning, the earlier you get help for anything, the better it would be for that person. So I know that at times it can be really hard for us, and also realizing for us as parents that 
it's more us than them. Yeah. We are the ones that are scared. We are the ones that are nervous. We are the ones, you know, but at the end of the day, we have to set those fears to aside and realize that our children are also humans and they need the help. They, they, they need to get the help. They, they, they need in order to be successful, you know, as adults, mm-hmm. we're not always going to be here with them. So listen, as early as you can get them any help, get it for them. Because I always say, I look back today and I'm like, yo, I wish I, I was in therapy. I would have been in therapy earlier in life because yes. I would have figured out a lot of shit mm-hmm. early. <laughs> before <laughs> early on. Right. So, you know, do that for your children as well. They deserve it. And, you know, check yourselves, check ourselves. We got to check your ourselves first because it is more of our fears and our ego. Yep. Getting in the way of things that, you know, would be helpful for our children. And I'm going to just, um, in the educational standpoint too, it's like, you know, when you're driving and, and, and like a, a rock hits your windshield and it, it's like just that little imperfection at the beginning. But then like, if you don't get it taken care of, it keeps going down and down and eventually cracking, cracking. it'll crack your entire window. Right. It's the same thing educationally. Right. Or, or, or therapy wise. Right. Mm-hmm. The faster, the earlier you get the help, the less therapy or the less, intervention you need like the the more time that you spend it's harder to catch a child up to his typically developing peers when that child is in fourth grade fifth grade sixth grade seventh grade yeah. you know it's easier when a child is 18 months to give them the help that they need so that and teach them the adaptive skills to be you know as close to their typically neurotypical peers as possible rather than wait until they're already almost in junior high school, which is, yeah. I had a child like that. I got evaluated and, and, um, you know, they got a diagnosis, an IEP in fifth grade. Yeah. You know, you're going to a completely different school. How, how mm-hmm. I, like for me as a teacher, as a special education teacher, yeah. like it's, it's hard to think about what their life is going to be like. Not that they're not going to have a good quality of life, but I'm just saying like mm-hmm. educationally, you know, education services, like it's not going to be the same. And the yeah. older they get, the less services they receive. Right. Right. And it's difficult. And I, and I, and you know, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to sometimes accept, right. That there could be something going on, but you know, paying attention to, to teachers feedback is important because remember that the teachers also see a side of our children that we don't get mm-hmm. to see, you know, and that's the part that a lot of parents um, that we as parents, cause I even include myself, we don't accept sometimes. And the reality is that no, a lot of teachers will see teachers and peers and, and even, you know, babysitters, daycare centers, Mm -hmm. they're going to see a part of your children that you do not see. Because remember, they're totally different people outside. Yeah, a lot of parents are combative. Like, you know, I I feel I don't feel some with certain parents, I don't feel comfortable bringing it up. Because it just makes them and I remember when when at first, like I used to be like, my kid, not my kid, you know, but, you know, you have to put the ego aside and kind of, like, really listen to what yeah. the experts have to say, you know. And, and it's and, and it's hard. You know, I, I like mm-hmm. I shared in the episode that aired this week was, like, I started crying. I started hysterically crying. Like, I was, like, devastated. And, yeah. and, and that's normal. But, you know, you have to put your big underwear on, your adult mm-hmm. underwear on, and, like, you know, do what's best for your child. Because at the end of the day, they're, you know, you have to – Give yourself, you have the responsibility of putting a, a, an adult out there that's going to be able to adapt to their environment and, and be a, a participating me- member of society, you know? Absolutely. So tell me about your book, Becoming a New You. Um, you yes. told us a little bit what you, what you covered, but like kind of give us the gist of it. Yeah, so my baby book. No, it's 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 ya está como in teenage years. Teenage years. I mean, <laughs> no, I saw no, the no. I saw the launch. It looked amazing. Oh my goodness! Yes, thank you so much. I threw a whole party to celebrate and stuff. But the book is about um, you know a guide to learning how your past can inform your present, and it really focuses a lot on some of the maladaptive coping um, mechanisms that that we developed. And then what I did was I. I, I, uh, broke it down into sections. So I did the four, the first four chapters are dedicated to women, Mm -hmm. but of course men could also read that those parts because 
for two reasons. One, because I want you to empathize with women and the things that we go through, right, during childhood and perhaps understand the reasons as to why certain things show up in our and the way that it shows up in our relationships. But also because I um I want uh, there's also parts of of those those chapters that can also uh be in relation to men right mm-hmm. that men can also relate to the same thing goes to the second section which is uh, uh dedicated to men and the third section section that is dedicated to couples but also single people can read because it's more about skill it's 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 learning about you know why marriages fail and tips and coping uh coping mechanisms and then i also provided uh uh questions Right. So because I want you for each chapter to really dive in and think deeper Mm -hmm. about how that showed up for you in childhood and do your own digging. Right. Mm -hmm. So so it's also kind of like a journaling. I love journaling. Mm -hmm. So I want people that are really that is that that are reading this book to read, but to also reflect on their own uh, stuff and, and really reflect on how those things may be showing up for them in their own relationship and also just have action like okay so these are the things that are going on for you and now you have here the strategies on how to change that for yourself so you have the tools now right like this book right here (laughs) this book right here right to the amazon um to the amazon uh uh uh, what is it amazon shop uh amazon thank you so much so yeah so this book right here right it, it it I wanted people, I wanted people to feel seen. I wanted people to feel heard. I wanted people to feel validated when they read it, right? That it makes sense that this is going on for you. Mm -hmm. It does make sense, right? Um, You know, we live in a world where we are constantly being validated. Our our opinions, our thoughts, you know, all of it. So, so I just wanted people to read this book and really feel connected and feel like they're actually speaking to me, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, When I, when, when they're reading it, but to also have the tools to change those behaviors to improve those behaviors because you know at the end of the day we have a lot of different parts of ourselves you know some parts i know that i'm not even aware of myself right but we all have so many parts of ourselves and that's okay uh what's not okay if it's we're we're not aware of them because then we can't change those things yeah right so so if we are honest with ourselves if we're transparent with ourselves if we're able to say you know what yeah i can be a little bit manipulative in my relationship then you're able to control that part of you. Yeah. You know, but if you're constantly saying, no, Joe, I'm not no manipulator. <laughs> what are you talking about? We would never be able to improve because, you know, I always say when my couples are going back and forth in my, in my sessions, <laughs> I typically say, okay, but well, hold on. Don't you want to learn about yourself? Yeah. And they, and they look at me like, what? And I'm like, I know it's really hard to hear right now. But aren't you curious to hear about why she's feeling the way she is? Yeah. Like, what are you doing that is making her feel that way? That's what we want to learn right now, Mm -hmm. right? And really make people have to, like, sit there in a way that is still feel safe, right? Because also the speaker, right? So she would have to really speak in a way that he could hear it, right? Or she could hear it. So so really learning how to sit and, and, and listen and take feedback because it's so important. But this book right here, my darlings... (laughs) <laughs> we'll provide you with some answers and some help and some support yeah and uh, today we're filming on the day before independent um book um book shop day um so go get it at a independent bookshop yes yes thank you so much yeah okay and then last question before we end the section the session and that is what does self-care look like for you yeah, self care look like for me. Listen, doing my nails, <laughs> it's a thing. Look, una se me rompió. I have one broken one, so I have to go tomorrow. Uh, doing my nails, doing my hair is actually a self care for me because that's a whole. <laughs> that is a whole situation. For the people that are not looking at the YouTube chat, uh, the YouTube video, she has amazing, beautiful curly hair. It's Thank very you. luscious. It's a Thank you so it's a much. luscious mane. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so as you can see, this is another thing that has to be done this weekend. <laughs> my hair. So doing my hair, spending time with the kids, watching movies with them, spending time with my husband. That's another way that I like really like take care of myself. You know, I also do journaling. I also I feel like another way of taking care of myself is by giving myself time to reflect on the stuff that I'm not 
doing really good at. So like if I'm feeling like my patience is running really low with the kids, I sit and I'm like, okay, what's going on? Like, where's this coming from? Because it's not them. Yeah. Right. Something else is happening for me that it's making me this anxious or making me this, you know, kind of reactive. What yeah. is it? So I feel like that's another part of me taking care of myself because I, you know, I learned that if one, if I don't take care of myself, who's going to take care of myself mm-hmm. because nobody else is taking care of uh, no one. No one's going to take care of me the way that I take care of me. Yes. You know? So I, yeah, I take care of myself to make sure that I'm also the best mom that I can be, the best wife that I can be, and the best therapist that I can be to my clients, mm-hmm. honestly. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, this was such a good conversation. Kiara, thank oh you so much gosh. for coming on the show. Yes. And shout out to Jose from Trilo for connecting us. Yeah, and- whoop, whoop. And, you know, just, um, you know, putting us in each other's paths. So, comadres, I'm going to end the show how I usually end it, which is follow me at Comadre on the pod on Instagram. And you can follow Kiara on IG at Drop your Mrs. Hand. Kiara Luna. Okay. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to send me a comadregram on, via email at comadreando at esethenetwork.com. Or slide up into my DMs. And I want to thank you for spending an afternoon with your comadres. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.